Hi, I'm Leon, and I'm here to present uh, Parallelism and Closure. So for context, uh, I work at the Climate Corporation. Uh, we're based in San Francisco. We, do, we model weather, and we model plants, and we give advice to farmers, and we do a lot of this in closure. For me, I've been uh, working at Climate and building weather models in closure for the past two and a half years. And I'm here presenting because I wrote a parallelism library called Claypool. So uh, the main ideas are, one, Clojure has quite good support for parallelism. Everything's very nice. However, it helps to know how things work. Uh, there are all, parallelism is complex. There are always things that can uh, bite you. And so knowing just how they're working will make everything go more smoothly. Also, there are a whole bunch of tools that uh, help with parallelism and closure, do much more advanced things than the built-in, and I'm going to talk about some of those. I'm going to spend more of my time on Claypool than on the others, not because I think Claypool is necessarily better, but because I wrote Claypool and I'll be more able to speak about it, so you'll get more benefit from me talking about it. As far as the structure goes, I'm going to have a running example, a little block of code that uh, we'll modify with, the, with different parallelism uh, tools so that uh, we don't have to keep looking at new code. I'll talk about how future works and how PMAP work. Those are the built-ins. I'll talk about some of the drawbacks, some of the minor frustrations I've had, and I'll talk about the other libraries and tools. Um, I'll start off with relatively beginner stuff to make sure that we're all on the same page. I assume most of you know that, know all about it, and uh, that will make it easier to talk about the advanced stuff. So the running example is some, a computation that we at the Climate Corporation do to, to help measure um, our models. So we, we have, suppose we have a time series of observed data, and we have a time series of model output, but the model output doesn't produce just a single variable, it produces a, a distribution, right, a bunch of samples. And we want to compare how good was our model given that data. So we compare for each time step, we compare the observed to our model, and we do that uh, with this CRPS function, and I don't want to go into the details of how CRPS works, so I'll just say we map this single CRPS function for each time step between the observed and the model output. And then we take an average, so we'll reduce by plus, and then we'll scale by, by the inverse of the uh, number of data points to get an average. And this is how we would measure the value of a model. And so there are a couple things to notice here. One, there's a lot of work happening. CRPS is kind of complicated, and, and all that work ha is happening in the map. Second, uh, there's a, this is a map reduce. That's common in closure because it's expressive, and that's common outside of closure because it's an easy way to get parallelism. In parallelism, you want to be able to divide your work, so it can be done simultaneously, and map is a good, a good way to divide that. So, you know, that's why Hadoop, MapReduce, Google MapReduce, stuff like that, use the same pattern. So, I'll start with future. So I've changed the example to insert a future. There, there are two pieces of work that are being done in this example. One of them is the CRPS calculation, but the other is that because our input may be a sequence, we don't know its length a priori. We have to actually go and count each one, and that'll take some time. So to save time, let's do that in the background. Let's do that in parallel with a future. Then in our main thread, we will map, we'll do our normal computation and reduction, and then we need to get the value out of that future. So we do that with DREF, or enclosure at is a reader macro for DREF, and so uh, it just rewrites into the function DREF. And so uh, this happens in the background. What exactly do I mean by the background? Well, I'll start by digging into future. So as we saw in the last presentation, closure is interesting to read, and some of the good parts are that A, you can just call source on something and see exactly how it works, and uh, also um, 
it's often quite concise and readable. So future is actually, the source of future, it's just a macro. It, um, it's a macro in the best style. That is, it does a very simple rewrite of your code. It puts your code into a function, so it can be called somewhere else. And then it ha has a helper function do all the heavy lifting. In that, this case, that helper function is future call. So makes a function to do your work and then calls future call. Well, what happens in future call? It submits your function to a solo executor. Um, this is Java stuff. And Java, A, it's not as easy to inspect, and B, um, just parallelism stuff is complicated on the inside. And so I'm going to start, uh, stop examining the code itself and just talk about roughly what happens. So I want to introduce threads. You probably know all about threads, but I'm going to, to just get us on the same page. So a thread is roughly something your computer could be doing, a sequence of function calls, and uh, each CPU can work on one thread at once. So in this example, I show two CPU cores with four threads, and each CPU core is working on one thing at a time. Well, what decides what it works on? What makes it change? The operating system is responsible for that. So every, there's a little hardware timer. Every so often it goes off. Your thread is interrupted, and operating system code jumps in and says, OK, what thread do we do now? Sometimes it chooses the same one, but sometimes it'll choose a different thread. Often it'll switch for fairness. You want all your threads to get to run, none of them to starve for CPU. Another reason threads might switch is that, um, another reason threads might switch is that they might need the operating system to do work. They might need something to happen that they can't do themselves. For instance, if they're reading from a disk or writing to a network interface, they don't have access to that. They, they do that by making operating system call. The operating system will say, whoa, you can't do anything now. I'll get back to you when I'm finished. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention here was the difference between concurrency and parallelism. Concurrency is when uh, more than one thing could conceivably, or two things could be possibly reordered, right? You don't know which thread will run at any given time. It could be thread A or it could be thread B, and so those could be disordered. Parallelism is when more than one thing happens at once. So you can get concurrency even on, with only one core, only one CPU. Um, parallelism requires more. Uh, you can actually have parallelism without concurrency. If you run multiple things simultaneously in lockstep, like what your GPU does, it runs a whole bunch of data computations, and it knows exactly what's happening at any time. Here I'm concerned with parallelism. I care about getting things done faster. So I'm going to focus on that one. So threads, threads have a little bit of overhead. They have overhead of two different types. One of the types is memory. Each thread uh, has to have a certain amount of memory allocated to its stack. It needs to know what data is each function working on and what is the, what is the sequence of function calls so that it can go back to each one when a function returns. So we don't want to have too many threads or they'll use up all our RAM. Also, threads take a certain amount of time to start. They take, it, it, it's not a lot anymore. It, it was tens of microseconds was the, was the benchmark I looked at. But all the same, you don't want to be creating threads constantly. So to amortize those costs, uh, there's a common, th a common pattern called the thread pool. Uh, the idea is we'll recycle our threads when we need a new thread, we'll see if we've got one just sitting around in our pool. If so, we'll use it. If not, then we'll get a new one. Then when we're done with it, we'll put it back into that pool. And if it's been sitting around for too long, we'll just throw it out. It's not being useful. We want to save that memory. So Clojure uses a single thread pool, the agent thread pool. It's shared for all futures and agents. I don't want to talk about what agents are. It's a little more than I have time for but basically all futures run in this thread pool. It has nominally unlimited threads. Uh, practically, it actually has max int, it will support max int threads, but you will run out of uh, memory long before you run out of integers. Uh, it also has an idle thread lifetime of 60 seconds. If the threads are sitting around for more than 60 seconds, 
they'll evaporate. Um, one interesting side effect of that is that these aren't daemon threads, so uh, if your main function exits, these threads are still running in the background, and the JVM doesn't know that they're not doing anything important, so your, your program won't exit. So you may have noticed if you just create, have a really small main and you uh, have a future and you do it rough it and it's all done, and then you return, your program doesn't exit, this is what's going on. The easy answer is just call system exit and you won't have any problem there. So, future has a few limitations. One is that it's not useful if your tasks are small compared to the overhead. Every time you uh, use a future, you're at least touching that thread pool. And you deref a future, you have to put it back in the, uh, or sorry, you deref a future, you have to get that value. So it always looks at le like at least a couple function calls and possibly tens of microseconds. So um, if you have a super small task compared to the overhead, like just an ink, the future isn't going to help. Also, if you want to control the number of concurrent threads, future will just let you create threads, uh, as many threads as you want. So you would have to do that, man you would have to control that manually. Uh, the one that I mind the most, I think, is that if you expect exceptions to work normally, they don't work normally in, in future. Um, they will be rethrown as a java.util.concurrent.execution exception. I'm sure there's a great reason for that, but basically it means that uh, futures are not transparent in Clojure. You can't just throw, it, throw one in and expect things to work normally. Instead, something funny will happen. So that was future. Future is simple. PMAP lets you do slightly more uh, complex things pretty easily. It's really just a parallel map. It runs roughly the next n CPUs plus three things in futures. And it's, did I mention it's lazy? It's lazy. So here in the example, again, one of the big pieces of work is we're doing this CRPS computation on each time step. So let's split that up. Let's do that in parallel. We'll just do a PMAP and we'll reduce Reduce isn't parallel, so that'll have to wait till all that work is done, and then we'll scale as normal. Ah. <laughs> of course, of course. PMAP, here we are. So, um, where was I? PMAP. So, again, let's just go ahead and look at how PMAP works. Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple, but we're going to, to go through all of this Anyway, this is, I didn't simplify this code. Uh, this is the actual code. So let's look at this. So n is roughly the number of things we want to compute at a time. We get the number of CPUs from the Java runtime, and we're going to add two because we want to run a couple more things just to keep our processors busy. Then we make this map of futures. This represents the work we're going to do. For each task, we just create a future to do that task. But remember that map is lazy. This, this doesn't actually create any of those features. This doesn't start any work happening. This is just a recipe for how we create those features once we get there. Step is complicated, and I'll come back to it. That's where all the work happens. So how, what, what do we actually do? We call step with rets, those futures, and drop in rets. So what is drop in rets? Well, for starters, it's lazy. It doesn't actually force any evaluation immediately. It's just going to drop them when it's, when it's forced. And this is a force ahead sequence. We're going to use this to cause the next few futures to be evaluated so that they'll start running. So that more work will be running than the, than the item in the lazy sequence we're looking at. So step, step takes two things. One is, a sequence of, uh, of, of futures. The second is this force ahead sequence, which we're just gonna use to cause futures to start. So PMAP is lazy, so of course it returns a lazy sequence. The first thing it does is, when it's forced, is it, eva is it uh, calls sequence on Fs, on the force ahead sequence. That causes, so seek, well, if, if a sequence is empty, Calling seek on it will return nil. So it has to check that if there's at least one thing. So it'll cause the first thing in it to be evaluated. So it will force the first element of the force ahead sequence, 
which forces the first n plus one elements of the, the features. So again, so if at the begin, so if we start with uh, a task with eight tasks and say two CPUs, so we're going to so n is four. Then we're going to start by forcing our force ahead sequence up to task four. Then we're going to dereference the first item. So we're not going to to continue until we've gotten until that first item has completed processing. And then we're just going to recur on the rest of both of those sequences, right? So we're going to use F's, the force ahead sequence, to keep work in the pipeline. So again, with two CPUs, the way that's going to look is we're going to have, uh, we're going to have the, we're going to start two tasks going in future, or the, there'll be five futures started, and the processor will work on two of them. When one is done, we'll do this deref, and we'll continue on. Then every time a task is complete, a processor will keep working on something else. But if that first task doesn't return, well, we're still blocking on this deref, right? We won't start any new tasks until that deref completes. So that's how PMAP works. So again, it's lazy. It needs to be driven. You have to do all or force it somehow. It generates threads as needed, right? It just uses futures to do the work. That means that if you have multiple simultaneous PMAPs, like if you're feeding one PMAP into another PMAP, or you are um, starting a PMAP in response to each user request in your service, then you could have lots of threads started, right? That might be inefficient. Also, I don't have time to talk about chunking too much, but just be aware that chunk, if, if you know about chunking, you can imagine how forcing a sequence of features could do something surprising if, if they're chunked. Um, and it runs roughly n CPUs plus three tasks. As I showed in the little example, a slow task can stall that. So until that first task completes, the re no more will be, be started. PMAP has, again, the limitation, the same limitations of future, because it's using features internally. So if your tasks are small, it's not so helpful. If you want to control the number of threads, uh, it's not perfect. And if you unexpect, and still it has the exception problem. Also, if you really want to saturate the CPU, well, it's lazy and it can block on slow tasks, so that might be hard. And if you want to parallel reduce, well, it's PMAP, not PReduce. It's just not going to help you. I also have a general caveat about uh, parallelism and laziness, which is that you have to be a little more careful. I have seen code that looks roughly like this, where, say, somebody creates a map and does that in the future, and then uh, is a little bit surprised when, that, when the work happens in series anyway. And of course, the reason is that no work actually happens when you create the map, it's lazy. Similarly, if you don't force a PMAP, no work will even start. So oftentimes, you want to do all. You need to force this work. Uh, so that's the basics. That's how parallelism works in Clojure. A couple nice tools. I want to talk about some of the uh, fancier tools. I'm going to start with the one that uh, most people know, I think, which is core async. So core async uses CSP channels and coroutines. It reads a lot like Go, because they come from a similar origin. And the idea is that you have these coroutines, which are like lightweight threads. Uh, they do cooperative threading. And they read and write from channels. So the channel transfers data between coroutines. The main advantage is that it makes it easier to do asynchronous processing. Oftentimes, if you or so the way asynchronous functions usually work is you give them a task and a callback function. When the task is done, they'll call your callback function. Well, if in your callback function you want to do something interesting, like say make another asynchronous call with its own callback. Well, very rapidly, you have callbacks within callbacks. It becomes hard to read. Core async helps flatten that out. It lets it, your program read linearly. So it uses cooperative multi-threading, which means that uh, your coroutines are lighter weight than threads, but they have to 
they have to work together. So core async will switch between coroutines every time one inter interacts with a channel. Only at those times will it switch. Those are backed by some number of, by some thread pool. I believe it's uh, 48 plus your number of CPUs. And uh, so each of those threads will be running one coroutine at a time. And when it hits a channel, it'll switch to it, possibly switch to a different coroutine. So because of that, core async is mostly for concurrency and asynchrony, not parallelism. You don't want to block its threads because, again, the coroutines aren't threads. If you block it, uh, work, if you block too many threads, it won't be able to keep working. So you uh, don't want to, say, do long sequences of computation between interacting with uh, channels, and you don't want to do blocking I.O. between interacting with channels. However, it's very easy to work on, wait on other work, and core async will let you spin up worker threads to do some of those things. You also can get parallelism using async's pipeline function, which runs a transducer between two channels with parallelism n, which means roughly it runs a pmap between two channels with a fixed amount of parallelism that you decide. Um, and that one's useful for CPU-based parallelism. If you want asynchronous parallelism, you need pipeline async. And if you want blocking I.O. parallelism, you need pipeline blocking. So uh, I don't find it maximally elegant, but it certainly can do the things you need. Also, exceptions will kill your coroutines. If your coroutine is doing some work and then it's going to write to a channel, but it encounters an exception first, it will never write to that channel. And that can mess up the flow of your asynchronous program. So you have to be a bit careful with that. So now I want to talk about the library I made, which is Claypool. So my motivation was basically the issues with PMAP that I described. I wanted, I want to get, I want to use parallelism to get as much work done as fast as possible with uh, as few restrictions as possible. And I want to control the amount of parallelism. So for starters, Claypool provides a PMAP that will use a, th a thread pool. So you can create your own thread pool uh, of, a, of a fixed size and more than one PMAP can share that thread pool. They will only create tasks, they only create features inside of that thread pool so that uh, you won't explode the number of threads if you do multiple PMAPs. Uh, one, one side effect is that you have to manage your thread pools yourself. The JVM will not clean up thread pools for you, alas. Instead, you have to manage them. So Claypool also comes with some tools for auto-managing thread pools. One is that if you give a number to PMAP, it will create a uh, it will um, create a thread pool of that size and destroy it when done. And also, you can use a macro uh, with shutdown that will take that will clean up your thread pool when it's all done. So Claypool is designed to help you get things done fast. By default, it's eager. Don't use it on, on an infinite sequence if you don't mean to do an infinite amount of work. The output is an eagerly streaming sequence, not a lazy sequence. Instead, it's a sequence where uh, as things are ready, they become available. But if you try to access something that's not complete, it will block. So the work is being done for you. You don't have to force that sequence. Um, and it'll become available as soon as possible. Uh, Claypool, importantly for my ta tasks, doesn't slow on sn slow tasks. So for example, just a really simple, small example showing some variance in your tasks. Do all PMAP and sleep, a random number from one to 10 milliseconds. Um, if, you're, if you're doing that, built-in PMAP ad averages 5.6 milliseconds per task. That's the average amount, that's the average number of milliseconds per task, plus a little overhead because sleep sleep's timing isn't perfect. Claypool PMAP does uh, 5.6 milliseconds per task per thread, the same but paralyzed. However, built-in PMAP, is a little bit hindered by that variance and averages 7.7 .7 milliseconds per task. Because sometimes it waits on the slowest task while well, fast tasks get completed. So Claypool has 
a number of simple nice things. For instance, you can chain sequences. Those streaming sequences, data will stream through all of them. Uh, you can share the same pool in your PMAPs or you can use different pools. Claypool also uh, lets you use all of the built in, all of the core parallelism functions such as future and p values. Nobody uses p values, but it exists, so it's implemented. Um, uh, with, a, with a thread pool, and it will use futures in that thread pool. Also, I, don't, I didn't know why you couldn't write parallel fours. I often find four easier to read than a, a map, and so you can write a parallel four with Claypool. However, only the body will happen in par parallel. It was much easier to write that way. So, the, so uh, the, the stuff in your bindings doesn't happen in, it happens in serial. Claypool also has unordered functions available. Um, the idea is that with an unordered function is that you get your output as it's complete, not in the order you gave it to it. That's helpful, for instance, if you have some, say, network process and you want to get some data uh, and start processing it as soon as possible. That way, you'll get the, you'll, uh, get the first task immediately and can start handling that. Um, there are also lazy functions available. They weren't my top priority, but they can be better for a couple of reasons, including uh, they can be better for chaining tasks. If you run a faster PMAP into a slower PMAP and they're both eager, then a buffer will gradually grow between them. Using lazy PMAPs, although they have that, or using lazy PMAPs prevents that, although then your sequence can block on slow tasks. So if you want to do it that way, you absolutely can. A few minor bonuses. Uh, exceptions get rethrown correctly. Um, so for instance, if you ex encounter an exception in your PMAP, you'll get that same exact exception on the outside of it. It also uh, eliminates, PMAP, or Claypool eliminates chunking. So again, if you know what chunking is, you don't have to worry about that. And uh, as a bonus that isn't the high, most highly used feature of Claypool, you can have priorities on your tasks. You have to create a separate priority thread pool, but then you can give each task a priority and they'll be done in roughly that order. It can only sort between sets of tasks that are already realized. So for instance, if, getting, if it's getting a lazy sequence or a streaming sequence, it will only run the highest available priority when it, when it has that chance. Okay, so that's Claypool. So I've got a couple more libraries to talk about. One is Reducers. So Reducers is a closure core library. It's gradually being replaced by Transducers, but uh, Transducers doesn't have parallelism, so I'm going to talk about Reducers. Uh, again, in our example, we want to compute our CRPS and sum it, so we're going to use Reducers map and Reducers fold. Reducers does give us a parallel reduce. So Reducers uses Java's fork join pool for its parallelism, which means it's really good for CPU bound operations. If you want a number of threads not limited by your number of CPUs, you can't get that. But it does provide a parallel reduce. Very similarly, there's a library, Tesser. Tesser, again, gives you parallel map and parallel reduce. It avoids Java's fork join pool, although it's cute, apparently it performs a little worse. So, or apparently fork join pool doesn't give maximal performance, so Tesser avoids it. It's also designed to max out your CPU. So the number of threads it uses will be limited by your CPU. Uh, as the main bonus is that it's also distributable on Hadoop. You can send it off to Hadoop relatively easily. I mean, you still have to give it like Hadoop configuration and Hadoop paths for input data and output data, but um, that's because that's how Hadoop works. It makes it about as easy as possible. So those are the libraries I wanted to talk about. In summary, Clojure has built-in parallelism and it's quite nice. There are futures, threads from, uh, threads from that built-in pool, there's PMAP. There are a few drawbacks that I talked about. They're not too major, but it's helpful to know what's going on.
There are a number of tools. Core Async is designed for asynchronous processing and CPU loading. Claypool, which I wrote, is designed to let you control very precisely the amount of parallelism in your program and to do work as fast as possible. Reducers is designed for, uh, again, CPU loading and parallel reduce, and Tesser, also the parallel reduce and Hadoop. So thank you. Uh, I should mention, I'm Leon at Climate, and uh, the Climate Co Corporation is definitely hiring closure engineers, so if you're interested, uh, contact me. And thank you very much for hosting me. Any questions?